Hi, I'm Dr. Paula Redmond, a clinical psychologist, and you're listening to the When Work Hurts podcast. On this show, I want to explore the stories behind the statistics of the mental health crisis facing healthcare professionals today, and to provide hope for a way out through compassion, connection, and creativity. Join me as I talk to inspiring clinicians and thought leaders in healthcare about their unique insights and learn how we can support ourselves and each other when work hurts. Today I'm joined by Dr Mia Hobbs, clinical psychologist and host of the popular podcast Why I Knit. Mia weaves a passion for the well-being benefits of knitting into her work as a psychologist. I began by asking her when and how she began to bring these two worlds together. It actually dawned on me later than it should have done, probably. But um, I think I first came, I mean, I was taught to knit as a child, but I first started knitting again because my mum said when I first started my doctorate, I was doing my first year exams and she'd met somebody whose daughter had also done the clinical psychology doctorate and had learnt to bricklay even though she didn't actually need a brick wall in her garden she needed really had a very strong need to do something that was completely different to psychology so my mum said you need to learn to knit and mostly to just keep her happy I did and then the next day so she said you can already do it um and she just taught me the basics and then we went to John Lewis the next day and bought some yarn and sent me back to London and I started knitting a big shawl. Um, So that's when I started. So she kind of did sow the seed, I suppose, of it being helpful for my mental health, I guess, even though she didn't probably say it in that way. But then I think I was just doing it in the background. There were a couple of other people on my training course who also coincidentally started knitting and maybe I kind of encouraged them a bit but I think it wasn't really until I was almost leaving the NHS that I was more consciously uh, thinking about combining the two and it was probably started as a bit of a joke when I was leaving saying oh I'm going to be running therapeutic knitting groups or I'm gonna because we had knitted some um, baby blankets for a colleague who had twins so um, lots of people came up to me and said can you help me knit something for these babies? And I thought, actually, it's quite challenging to knit a hat or a cardigan if you're not really a knitter or you're a very rusty knitter. So we ended up, I ended up buying some yarn, giving everybody some, and then they knitted squares and then I crocheted them into blankets. And I think through doing that together on like kind of random lunch breaks, it did feel like it made a big difference to the kind of team morale, really. And... I ended up having different conversations with colleagues and people stopped working and didn't eat lunch at their desks. And um, yeah, and I think that made me think a bit more about it. And I think leaving the NHS was difficult for me. It wasn't really in my plan. So I also was at that point had started to use knitting a bit more deliberately. So I deliberately chose a big project that was my kind of transition project, I suppose to take me through that transition of leaving and starting something new that I didn't really quite know what it would look like. Oh, so tell me about that project when you made that deliberate choice. Um, What did you choose? What project did you choose? So I chose a big shawl, uh, which was actually knitted. So there's quite a lot of nice kind of metaphors, really. So it's a shawl that's knitted uh, in two parts that you then knit them together once you've knitted the same thing twice so in a way it was quite a nice metaphor for these two parts of my career coming together I'm not sure I consciously chose it because of that I think I saw lots of pretty versions on Instagram at the time and wanted to make one but I felt like I could allow myself to buy a kind of it was quite a lot of yarn I chose some nice yarn and I'd been thinking about knitting it for a while and it felt like yeah this was my thing I was going to work on and I think probably it gave me a sense of something I like a project that was predictable and under my control when actually things career-wise were turning out to be completely different to how expected like I didn't expect to leave the NHS really in my career and suddenly that was what was happening and I think it it kind of helped and it helped that it was big because I think actually 
it allowed me to make space for that transition that actually, despite wanting to just do it and the new venture to be a success, that doesn't happen overnight, obviously. So I think it helped me to see it as a bit of a process. And actually, I really struggled to finish it. Uh, I did the first half and then starting from the beginning, as in my career, <laughs> felt like I had to take a big deep breath before, oh, now I have to cast on the same stitches and knit what I've just done all over again. And I think starting from the beginning was hard in both ways and it took me a while to get going on the second one. So it probably was not finished for a year after I left my NHS job, but it's really nice to have it now, this huge, like, shawl, rectangular shawl. Um, and it's nice to have that kind of, that will always signify that kind of change, I suppose, for me. So it still holds a lot of meaning for you. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Yeah. So it sounds like, I guess in, in what you're describing, there's something about the actual process of doing it, um, but also the finished product also has meaning for you. Yeah, and I think that's definitely true of my relationship with knitting, that the process is probably the most important thing for me. If I was stranded on a desert island with one ball of unappealing brown yarn, I would still for sure knit and unravel it and knit it again. <laughs> But it is really nice to have the uh, memories in the finished objects or that they're, I don't know, uh, intended to be gifted to somebody. Or So can you tell us more about the process? If we think about knitting in particular, what is it about knitting that um, can be helpful in terms of well-being? So Betson Corkhill is a, she was originally a physiotherapist and has is kind of the expert on therapeutic knitting. And she's got a knitting equation that breaks down some of the factors that are uh, helpful or thought to be helpful in knitting. So one of the things is the hand movements. So they're kind of complicated movements, which are with both hands and crossing the midline of the body. So if we think about therapies like EMDR, there's a lot of similarities, I suppose, in the repetitive kind of soothing movements that there's an idea that those type of movements are soothing for our brains and I guess we as humans spend a lot of time doing less and less things with our hands and doing more and more things on screens or in our brains. <laughs> so in, in a way, it probably is more of a different type of movement that we're not doing so much of any anymore. Um, so there's an idea that there's something soothing about those repetitive movements. I think knitting specifically is quite good because it's very easy to do a tiny bit of it. And I think certainly when I'm using it in my work, if somebody's feeling anxious or they're feeling low in mood, it can feel difficult to get going with anything. But with knitting, you could just do a couple of stitches and still make progress towards a bigger goal. And even for myself, I find like I also sew, no sewing machine to make uh, clothes, but it's a lot more difficult to find the time to get everything out. <laughs> set it all up whereas with knitting I could just stick it in my bag and if I suddenly I don't know the bus is stuck in traffic I can knit or if you get a few seconds you can do a little bit and it all makes progress so I think that is quite helpful especially if we're feeling low and you could just do a tiny bit in five minutes. So the other things I suppose are that it gives you what Betts and Corkhill calls an enriched environment so that is the idea of being creative, there's colour, there's different textures, there's um, the idea of kind of making safe mistakes that you can kind of unravel it and redo it and that it's, yeah, gives you an opportunity, I suppose, to be a bit playful with something that doesn't, it's not related to your job, it doesn't really matter, you can't really get it wrong in any dramatic fashion. You've always got what you started with, unless you get the scissors out. So it's quite accessible, I think, to lots of people. It doesn't take much time or many props. I think the other thing is, you know, you can, like it's portable, you could do it in a waiting room. Or So for people who do feel like they access a sense of calm, if, for example, they were anxious about social situations or going on public transport or the dentist, you could bring it with you. And I feel like, certainly for me, that feels like a really great thing even though I don't feel for example massively worried about the dentist I don't love the idea of going for a filling so it feels nice to be able to sit in the waiting room and 
and I think I'm someone who feels like they've got a lot of pressure on their time it feels like I'm doing something useful or getting something out of little tiny moment pockets of time that I happen to have waiting for something yeah yeah I can really resonate with all of that I think for me I learned to knit as a child as well um we had to do lent knitting at school <laughs> so for the the 40 days of lent we were all supposed to knit squares and then they'd all get knitted up usually by our mums or grandparents at the end and, and donated to charity so we all had to learn um but it was when I was an adult and actually after the birth of my first child um where you know I'd always had a kind of creative outlet I'd always probably gone to an art class or something but then when my son was born I couldn't go out couldn't do anything um and picked it up again as a way of just having something really accessible that I could you know didn't have the house didn't have to be clean I didn't have to have a clear table I could just um you know pick it up and do something and yeah. I think that I think a lot of people return to it when their yes. kids are small yeah I think yes. also because it's a time when it's so challenging to have any time for yourself or anything for yourself um and a lot of the tasks you end up doing like keeping a small human alive you can't really I mean the human's hopefully still there by the end of the day but you can't really see a lot of like oh there were 12 nappies I changed today or you know all of those tasks reset again the next day don't they yeah and I think that thing of you know especially you know being a first time mum just feeling completely incompetent at everything um and that sense as you said of of not really feeling like uh yeah I was getting I had much control of my life or anything so yeah being able to have a concrete um some concrete evidence of of making progress and yeah and I think the control thing actually is something I've thought more about recently, the idea of having a thing that, because I think, um, you know, a lot of people I've spoken to in the podcast are thinking about their experiences in COVID, for example, and the idea of everything like the whole world is quite scary and unpredictable in a way that we've never experienced before. And that, you know, the idea of having a particular knitting project that is, you know, something I can think about and switch off the literally switch off the news or thinking about uh the big scary world but this like I've got the recipe and I know how it's going to turn out I remember also you know a time when I was working in the NHS and mental health services and just feeling really um you know really working really giving so much every day but not feeling like I was making a difference and it was a time when we were having our garden kind of redone and paths laid and things and I would come home every day and like you know this path was built or this flower bed was done or a fence was up and I remember feeling so jealous of the the garden landscape man because he could look back at the end of his day and see oh my gosh I you know made a garden whereas I felt like I was looking back at the end of my day and thinking what have I done what I have achieved like I'm exhausted I'm drained but what difference have I made to the world? I think that's really interesting. I remember having similar conversations actually when we just with my kind of friends from my clinical training when we just qualified. Because I think up until that point, like I guess to be a clinical psychologist, you've all, you know, it's quite a long journey. <laughs> and then your life changes once it's finished and you think, oh great, I've got there. But all of the energy and drive and uh, being someone who's, to some extent been good at or lucky at jumping through various hoops and there's a kind of a score <laughs> on whether you're making progress and then all of a sudden there isn't and um thinking about oh it would be quite appealing to be in a career where there was a really clear correlation with hard work <laughs> and outcomes because <laughs> that isn't the world that we inhabit really I know that in your podcasts um you, you have talked to lots of health professionals or, or people who work in a health context and I wonder what your reflections are of, of how knitting in particular can be useful and relevant to health professionals in particular. Yeah, it's interesting. It does seem to, there do seem to be quite a few health professionals who knit and I guess maybe I've attracted them because I am one <laughs> and they've been interested in the podcast. But I think, I suppose I had this theory from, um, actually from salsa dancing, which I used to do, that I went to salsa and there were loads of doctors there. 
and I didn't really understand why there were so many doctors at Salsa. And then I suppose I developed theory when my husband, who's a doctor, came along, mainly for my sake. And he quite liked the idea of if you're busy thinking about counting and, you know, arm and leg movements, you can't possibly be thinking about work. And I think as health professionals, we do have quite stressful, busy jobs. And I think, and I suppose I call it just um, active relaxation. So I suppose I sometimes feel like in order to relax, my brain needs to be completely absorbed in a thing. It can't be a passive switching off thing like watching Netflix because that's not enough for my brain. My brain will freelance and go looking for uh, stress or tasks or making to-do lists. Um, whereas if I'm knitting something extremely complicated, I just have to pay attention and that relaxes me. And I think that has been a topic that has come up time and time again, like needing something sometimes quite complicated that it absorbs all your brain. Um, quite a few of the health professionals I've spoken to have been doctors. So there has also been a theme of like, they are quite high achieving people, I suppose. And they, you could see in the way they talk about knitting that they're, they like the, you've never run out of challenges. There's always a new kind of, they quite, they want to finish projects. They want to learn the next thing. So I think that is appealing to some of them. I think also there's something to do with, maybe we are people who feel a strong drive to be useful to others. So the idea of knitting for other people, like gifting to, we want to there to be a purpose or a point. I think I could see a parallel there with like health professionals. Um, and I think we're not always uh, have, we don't always have the opportunity to be that creative, maybe in our jobs. Maybe we as psychologists a bit more, I don't know. So I feel like there's something about it just being very different like that that's a different uh, part of our brains we're stimulating when we're doing something creative. And certainly for me, I think I crave making things with my hands. And for me, knitting is also has the benefit of it producing something that then is useful. So I was, for example, I tried various other things and doing some cross stitch and things. But what I didn't really love was the fact that once it's finished, didn't really know what to do with it um whereas I like now that when it's finished now it becomes something I wear on a daily basis like my cardigan or and I'll be honest I didn't expect this but once I started like wearing things I'd made to work I did really like that people noticed and said you know because for me it turned a compliment about my appearance into something more like valuable to me like, oh, you're clever or you're creative, <laughs> which to me feels more meaningful than you look nice. <laughs> so I did like that. And I, I was wondering a couple of things. I guess I was wondering about the kind of non-verbal processing that knitting might allow or enable. Um, so what you were talking about a bit earlier, that, that kind of... Um, you know, repetitive movement that I guess you really need to slow down to do it. You can't be knitting and running around doing other things. You have to stop, you have to slow down. So I guess there's an advantage of that in, particularly if you're working in a very high, you know, high threat environments, that just the benefit of being able to slow down and um, sort of calm your nervous system but also, I guess as health professionals, although often it can feel very normal, we're often exposed to a lot of trauma and distress in our work, which, you know, sometimes we can talk about, other times we can't, um, especially at home. You know, lots of people don't want to talk about work at home for lots of reasons. And I, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think the process of knitting is can be helpful in that sense of being able to process difficult stuff. I definitely think a lot of people have spoken about the idea of it helping to slow them down or ground them. And somebody recently was talking about the idea of it kind of literally, physically seatbelting them to their chair, she said. So that was on another podcast, a knitting podcast that um, I listened to. And so I think, you know, there maybe there are 
those of us who are busy and use busyness as part of a coping strategy to not think about things but that's a way of kind of forcing yourself to slow down which we all need to sometimes and like you said yeah I think that's a good point about the non-verbal processing and quite a few people have spoken about that in relation to things like bereavement for example the idea of it being especially if you're knitting with somebody else the idea of having kind of a way of having companionship but without necessarily having to talk about things that might feel difficult or that ultimately people can't say anything that's going to change the thing you're feeling very sad about and maybe you don't want to talk <laughs> all the time but it's a different way of um and certainly def definitely people have mentioned on the podcast the idea of kind of using their hands as a way of feeling like accessing calm and processing things like working things through and having thinking about things in a different way but probably in a way that feels easier a lot of people on the podcast have also spoken about the idea of being like failing at meditation <laughs> so it really does seem that there is a collection of uh, knitters who feel like they are not have not been great at accessing standard kind of mindfulness or meditation but are aware of the idea that that would be something helpful but have found knitting an easier way of doing that and I definitely think I would include myself in that um and I physically feel like it lowers my blood pressure um you know I've never been a smoker but I remember my grandma used to smoke and after meals it would be like she really wanted a cigarette she, she can't always, you could see that she physically was kind of a bit jangly and wanted a cigarette and i feel like that with knitting like if I I do feel really feel like it kind of grounds me in the same kind of quite physical way really yeah I'm also always aware of a kind of sense of discomfort if I'm between a project projects you know if I finish something and then haven't quite got the next thing yet I would never allow myself like to that get into that state <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you'd always have something lined up already yeah. <laughs> and I don't make very fast progress because I've got more than one thing on the go at once because I like to have different tasks for different kind of requirements so I think at the moment I think much more about the process of knitting than I do about the I wouldn't knit something I didn't want but I think much more about what do I need it to offer me right now so I like to have something more simple that I could knit if I was, you know, in a waiting room, waiting for children to do an after school club or I don't know, um, doing a Zoom training. I would find it much easier to sit still and listen to a workshop if I was knitting and then something more complicated, maybe for in the evenings where I feel like actually it needs to absorb my brain a bit. So it's more of that active relaxation I was talking about. Um, yeah, so I would not allow myself to have finished everything all in one go so I didn't have anything to work on. The other thing I was thinking about which, which maybe applies to, to creative pursuits more generally but I think for health professionals there can often be a sense of working in a really dehumanising context where you're kind of you know a small cog in this big machine and you know just a number on a rotor kind of replaceable you know not really seen as a as a person often people's you know basic human needs aren't aren't met at work and I guess there's something about the creative process and you know making unique decisions about something that can help us you know stay connected with our humanity and also be seen in that way so I was thinking about you and your cardigan you know something about people noticing something unique about you you know seeing you um is something you know really nice yeah definitely true and I think especially in big organizations like the NHS the opportunity to be creative or to make changes I suppose for me felt increasingly small the opportunity to do that felt increasingly corporate or that the wheels turn very slowly in any big organization don't they there's 800 people who have to sign off on doing anything different or new and um yeah so this is quite nice that you you can have a new project and you're completely the boss of you know you see that cardigan and I suppose I quite like the planning process as well that 
you know, I needed to have this yellow cardigan that I had <laughs> in my head and I went, you know, went through all the steps to making it happen really. So I guess that did, does give a sense of achievement. I think the other thing that made me think of is also the, uh, the a thing people talk about a lot on the podcast is the connections to other people. So having a different community of people who are not like, I don't know about you, but many of my friends are healthcare workers <laughs> and in a way it's quite nice to meet other people from completely different walks of life where you have this just this different thing that you connect over and it isn't your work and it's not stressful and it's about yarn or patterns so that has I think brings a lot of people kind of a joy on a different level and the you know the yeah being a bit creative so the I think it, we do have quite a difficult challenging job and spend a lot of time with distress and I feel like for me it's definitely an area of my life where it's just about the pleasure or the joy of it really. And I was thinking what you were saying about connecting with other people and also the that the role of, of making something for someone else can really help you stay connected with those other identities those other roles you might have in your life that are outside of work so um, I've you know mostly knit stuff for other people if people are having babies or kids stuff or tea cozies <laughs> and that feels really important to I guess meaningful and, and being able to nurture those identities that can often get neglected when we're very caught up in work yeah and I think certainly a lot of people on my podcast have talked about it as like a way of sending like a a hug like a knitted hug to somebody especially in covid when people couldn't physically you know had a new grandchild who was born and they couldn't physically see them so that and I certainly feel like that about knitting for other people it's a way of you know it's a lot of hours that go into anything you've knitted for somebody of thinking about the person and knitting all the kind of love and affection into the into the object so I think yeah, that definitely is part of it. And I think actually going back to what you said about having a kind of sense of individuality, I certainly feel like it has become, it's kind of changed my relationship with clothes, I think, <laughs> that it's a way of, um, yeah, just having a different relationship. I don't look at clothes in shops anymore. I think about what do I want to make? And then it has another life as a clothes I wear. <laughs> Um, but I think that it, that was nice actually going into work and it is a bit of, I suppose, carefully considered self-disclosure, I suppose, with your clients, that being a bit more you in the room. Um, and I've decided it's one of the things I do talk about, about myself. The other thing you mentioned that I think is interesting and important is the idea about making safe mistakes. Um, mm. Were those the right words? Were those the words you said? Yeah, that's what yeah. I talk about, is safe mistakes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I think is a real challenge for health professionals, isn't it? Yes. Just, you know, I mean, I think we're selected, we're often, you know, highly perfectionistic people, but also often working in, you know, a, a situation where the mistakes are really high stakes and there's a lot of scrutiny and, um, you know, making a mistake is really anxiety-provoking having an opportunity to play around with that yeah and I think I certainly I've something I really feel like I've taken a lot of value from knitting into the rest of my life really in terms of my relationship to mistakes or having to unravel things and I think you know I certainly have the concept and I think most knitters do that amazing excellent knitters make mistakes all the time they unravel stuff all the time like wouldn't it be amazing if we could say that about other things in our lives? <laughs> amazing parents make mistakes. Like, how does it feel? It feels different, doesn't it? But I think it's made me more patient, for example, like definitely with starting up in private practice, having a business, the idea of you kind of feel like you want to have all the answers and get it all sorted at the beginning, but that's not how it works. And I feel like knitting has maybe been more patient. And, you know, just recently I unraveled an entire torso of a colorwork sweater all of it because it didn't fit the way I wanted it to and I don't think that was perfectionism because I didn't have to do it I didn't feel anxious about doing it I'd already knitted the same sweater it fits too tight like I don't like how it fits 
So I was knitting another version in order for it to be a more relaxed fit sweater. And it didn't, because it's all over colour work, the floats are too tight. So I've re-knitted it and I feel entirely at peace with that decision because I love knitting. You know, I'm going to knit. <laughs> I've got better value for money out of this yarn in a way um, because I've knitted the whole thing twice. Um, so I feel like I'm more patient with myself in other realms of my life probably because of that it's okay like to unravel the stuff that's not working <laughs> yes yes yeah um, uh, yeah I agree I, th I think there is something about it being a really helpful practice ground for developing self-compassion um and I guess and I think in the groups I've I'm running I do find like it's something we come up against very quickly is the idea of having like kind of panicking when you've made a mistake and that you know you ultimately choose what you do about that whether you know you can just carry on and live with it or you can say actually no that's going to annoy me I'm going to go back and sort it out but you can choose <laughs> you're the boss and it's a very safe way of practicing it not being perfect or seeing your progress because it wasn't perfect in the beginning and now look it looks prettier um it's more even and more relaxing and I guess if I think about the de definition of of compassion being a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others and a commitment to alleviate it the that first part about being sensitive to the suffering of others I guess we need to be able to tune in to what's going on particularly if we're thinking about self-compassion and just that process, you know, you described of, you know, kind of checking in, like, what do I need right now? You know, what, what is going to be the process that's going to be most helpful for me right now is also good practice for that. And I think that's the thing that experienced knitters say that they maybe haven't thought about before. Like, for example, if they've listened to the podcast, the idea of thinking about their knitting as a part of their self-care and thinking, what do I actually need right now? Do I need to knit something complicated? Do I need to knit something fluorescent pink? Do I need something really easy that's not going to annoy me? And actually for some people who I've interviewed who work, have more of their, you know, their uh, work life is in the craft kind of industry. Or, for example, some people who are high achieving people um, who might have been, you know, medics, for example, can have got to the point where they have quite high standards for themselves and then think actually this isn't relaxing anymore and they need to go and you know sometimes we need to go and do something else like where we don't have expectations of ourselves and that might be painting by numbers or making something out of polymer clay or doing lego like i think we need to be open to the transferability of the idea of therapeutic knitting it doesn't have to be knitting and certainly in my client group i work with you know adolescents children and adolescents and Often knitting is not something they're customers for, but we can use the idea behind engaging in something, some kind of therapeutic craft that might give them a sense of achievement. It might give them a little spark of joy in their day, might help them switch off from revision. And that might be Lego or it might be something uh, scratch art or painted by numbers or something completely different. Mm. So the importance of kind of psychological flexibility in, in how we... Look at yeah. this too. Yeah. Because knitting won't be for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So what, if we if we think about, I mean, some of the barriers to knitting as, you know, knitting isn't going to be for everybody, but for, for, um, for people who might want to, you know, get into it or develop it more, what are the common barriers that, that come up for people? I'd say... Often, I think I'm still not massively, I still think I probably think carefully about who I mention it to. And maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should mention it to everybody. I think actually when I was running a group in a primary school, I was curious, so I'd, uh, the Senko had decided which um, pupils were gonna come to the group. And I was wondering like in terms of, for example, gender, uh, who, would get, who would be in the room? And in the primary school, it was a very even, split of boys and girls and actually everybody was up for I said to them you know I want them to be interested in the idea of trying <laughs> they need to uh, want to be there at least a little bit or to be open to it but they were and in a secondary school it's an all-female group 
so I wonder whether that has changed with age or whether it's down to who the person who's set it up in terms of who they've thought to ask or maybe they've asked boys and they've said no I'm not sure I should ask probably so I think maybe the ideas about knitting being a more female thing I think I do get quite a lot of people who say that they have tried someone's tried to teach me and I was unteachable I tried to learn as a child and I just couldn't do it those kind of things and I think you know I think a lot of us I certainly learned as a child for a little while it didn't get, ever go anywhere but I went back to it and it stuck and I think that's a very common story and and what has the reception been to the work that that you're doing and your podcast do, do you feel like it is actually something that resonates I've been really overwhelmed by the response to the podcast so lots of people have emailed me messaged me on Instagram and I think that in a way I think knit, there was this kind of narrative already I suppose I think most people who knit feel it benefits their mental health and I think you could see that in small ways that I attributed like I put that label on I suppose so you see like people selling enamel pins that I knit because uh, punching people is frowned upon which I suppose to me said knitting is helping keeping me calm um so so I feel like there has been a really uh positive response to that and I feel like also I've had emails from people saying that they've thought about their knitting differently as a result of listening to um how we've talked about how it benefits their mental health they've thought about their projects differently or been more intentional about their knitting rather than feeling I've started this cardigan I have to finish this cardigan which I don't think is all the, always the right thing I think the most important thing is what's it doing for me <laughs> right now and if this isn't the right thing for me to be working on because I just don't have the headspace for it right now then I need to find something else or if I need a quicker sense of achievement I can't be working on a colour work sweater that's going to take me six months. <laughs> so what would you um, say to people who might be listening to this and you know maybe are not knitters and you know are curious about how to get into it how to get started what would you say? I would say that if you're interested in knitting, then it's definitely worth giving it a go. It couldn't really be easier, you know, now that you can learn so much on YouTube. Um, I've made a PDF, actually, so if anybody wants one of those, they could send me an email with about how to get started and why would you do it for your mental well-being. Um, because there are lots of YouTube videos out there on teaching you to knit and... Um, I suppose I've gone through enough of them to know which are the really good ones <laughs> that are with really good kind of clear instructions or slow motion videos so that you can really, um, and good patterns for beginners. So the PDF has got those things in it. And it also tells you how to find, buy some needles and yarn that are the right size for each other. Cause that, you know, is a bit like learning the, the lingo of a new <laughs> thing. You have to be able to decode the what size needles and that kind of thing. Um, with some tips about not getting an overly fluffy yarn that's going to get in a tangle easily and those kind of things. Um, but it, if it's knitting isn't for you, then I would think about, you know, the idea of if you were having a creative outlet, what would it need to offer you? <laughs> do I need something easy that I can already do? Do I need something complicated so I don't think about work while I'm doing it? And to start there, really, and think about what appeals or maybe it's something you've done before. And... What about for people who are established knitters um, and who might want to uh, explore, you know, using knitting more intentionally for their well-being? For me, I would still start with thinking about what am I knitting now and what is it doing for me? Is it giving me the relaxation I need? Is it giving me the challenge I need? What kind of project do I need? So thinking a bit more intentionally about planning projects. I think also... One of the helpful things about knitting is that you get a sense of achievement. So I think sometimes deliberately monitoring your progress, so putting a safety pin in or a like a little rescue line um, so that you can see, actually I have, especially if you're knitting something big, I have made progress. And actually Instagram's quite good for that. I often end up looking back at my previous Instagram posts and thinking, oh, I feel like this sweater's growing really slowly, but actually, that was only a month ago and I've done loads since then. Um, and it's also a really good place for 
inspiration I think if you're thinking about what do I want to make there are a lot you can see different versions of using a hashtag for a pattern of every single pattern out there so I think that's been yeah helpful for me in terms of inspiring me to find new things to knit I think the other thing I always encourage new and established knitters is to show and tell <laughs> so to access the kind of you know positive feedback of having someone to show your work to really and get you know kids are so good at that <laughs> they go and draw a picture and they're desperate to show somebody look at this I've just drawn and we just get out of the habit I think as grown-ups but I think I certainly love and encourage my friends who who might not be you know they're not as fanatical as I am about knitting but I'm like I always love to see what you're knitting and that you've done that you know you're proud that you've done this hat or whatever it is and to have someone in your life, even if they're not a knitter, that you show things off to. <laughs> or it could be on Instagram also. That's another way of doing it. And also just to monitor, like, how is this making me feel right now? I certainly feel like if I could rate my, like, calm before knitting and then sit down and knit for 20 minutes, I would feel calmer afterwards. But likewise, it doesn't always go like that. If you feel like, actually, this is just annoying me right now. It's too complicated. I'm stressing about where I am in the pattern, then maybe that's not for me right now. Yeah, maybe it needs to go and sit in the naughty cupboard for a while and try knit something else more simple. <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please do share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. I'd love to connect with you, so do come and find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. You can also sign up to my mailing list to keep up to date with future episodes and get useful psychology advice and tips straight to your inbox. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks again and until next time, take good care. Bye.